growing up, I had, um, I got to see my parents, you know, how they loved each other, how they did things together. And growing up, I, you know, I wanted the same thing. I started high school and my first thing was to graduate. That was my goal is to graduate and go off to the Air Force. But I met this guy that was very popular. And I was a freshman, he was a sophomore. We started dating. And um, the first year was great. The second year, um, it started to be more of, he wanted me to be with him, only him. He started to take me away from friends. Um, he started to be very controlling. Um, watch my moves, what I did, where I went. So I started to, I started to be around him more. I thought it was cute because you know, that he wanted to be around me. He was jealous when I hung out with my friends. He wanted all the time. So I thought it was a cute thing, but I did not know the signs of, that was a part of domestic violence. Um, it started to be more of a verbal abuse. Uh, once we left high school, he graduated first before I did. I got pregnant my senior year and um, after uh, had our, our, our first child, we got married. Um, he was telling me, you know, you might as well marry me. We got, you know, we got a daughter together. Ain't nobody gonna want you with the child. You might as well, we're gonna, you know, we need to be together. So we ended up getting married after we had our um, first ch child, Mercedes. And um, after we got married, um, I got pregnant with our second child. I was about two months pregnant when the physical abuse started. He started to, um, he started with the push. He pushed me when I was two months pregnant. And then after that, it started with, uh, you know, a punch. And then it started to where the punch started to be a little bit harder. Then it started to where he started pulling my hair, pull, dragging me across the, the room, dragging me wherever he needed me to be. Um, it's still verbal abuse. So it was now verbal abuse, physical abuse, and mental abuse. It started to get worse and worse. Um, he used to beat me like I was a man. He used to beat me down. Um, I had black eyes. Um, sometimes I had both of my eyes so swollen from the beating that I couldn't see. Um, I, I would go to the hospital, get treated, but then when they started questioning me about, you know, you came last week with this, now two weeks later you're back with this, you know, they started to question that. And so I kind of stopped going only when I was really hurt. Um, he moved me to California so that we could start a new life there, started to do better, but it was worse. Um, he used to beat me up in front of his brother and his brother's girlfriend couldn't jump in because then she would, you know, get, get it from his brother. And so vice versa, she would get beat up from his brother and I couldn't jump in because then I would get, you know, a beat down. And um, she finally, left him and she moved back home. And so I was there by myself with both of them. And um, I was the only one working. And then I, I got pregnant with our third child. So I couldn't work because I really had a, uh, it was a, a stressful pregnancy. And I gave birth to our third son. I had a C-section with all three of my kids. Um, when I got out the hospital, um, I, we were homeless. Um, we had to find a place to stay because we didn't have a home. And we moved in with this lady that his brother and him, that him and um, his brother knew. And um, he would disappear for days, which when you get married, you always want to spend time with your partner. You always want to have them around. You always want to do things with them. But to mine was a little bit different. I was kind of glad that he would not come home, even though that was sad to say, but just because I knew that I had that peace, that peace at that moment where I was able to be myself with my children. And that night, one night he had came home and he was drunk and I had just put the kids to sleep. He wanted to um, sleep with me and I told him that I didn't, I, I didn't want to be with him. And so that was like a no-no, you don't tell him no. So he beat me, he tried to kick me in my stomach to open up the C-section. So as I'm bleeding, he jumps on top of me and that night he raped me. He got up and as I'm crying, he laughed at me and he said, who's going to believe you 
that I raped you. You are my property. You are my wife. So you belong to me. Ain't nobody, nobody's going to believe you that I did that to you. And in my mind, I said, like, that's true. You know, who is going to believe me now that I know so much more that was rape? Well, that night I conceived um, our fourth child. I was pregnant. Um, after my face healed from the abuse that night, I called my mom and I told her, hey, I need you to buy me a, play, I mean, a bus ticket for me and the kids so I can come back home. Don't ask questions, just get me back home. And as she said, okay, you know, and as I was leaving um, California, he found out and he tagged along to go back home to Amarillo, Texas. And that beating got worse. Um, one night, he um, had picked up his brother. He had picked me up from work and we picked up his brother from a friend's house and some girl had came outside. Well, I guess because he got caught with this girl cheating or whatever you want to call it, um, he took it out on me and he punched me in my face because I was, because, you know, she was looking. I don't, I don't know what his issue was, but he punched me in my face. And so I jumped out the car because his mom lived not too far away from where we were at. I jumped out the car, started running to get to his mom's house. And he chased me with the car and he tried to run over me with the car. So I jumped the fence through this um, elementary school and I started running. So he jumps out the car and he chases after me. So he grabs me by the hair, pulls me down and he stomped stomped me. He started kicking me in my face, in my head. I got knots in my head where he had kicked me. Um, he stomped this arm out of socket and his, um, his cousin pulled him away from me and he just kept telling me, run Liz, run. And so as I'm running with pain, um, he comes after me and he catches up to me and he starts beating me again. Where this lady that lived in front of the house that he was beating me up, she comes out to help me. And he jumps on her, but she tells me to run in the house and call 911 because she's like, he don't want me, he wants to hurt you. And so I called 911, the uh, police officer showed up um, and a, a police report was filed by the lady. Um, the last time he hit me was in December of 1994. Um, I had came home from work and he was upset um, to this day, I don't know why he, he was upset, but I said something to him and he just snapped. He grabbed me and threw me against the wall. Then he grabbed me by, he st started punching me. Then he grabbed me by my hairs and threw me against, um, down to the floor. Um, I pushed him away and that's one thing an abuser doesn't like when you hit back. And that day I decided to hit back. And so he grabbed my hands and pinned them underneath his knees so I wouldn't hit him back. And he just started punching me. And so in my mind, I was like, okay, Liz, he's punching you. You can't get up. He's stronger than you. So turn your face to one side so he can just damage one side. You'll be able to see on the other side and be able to go to work. That's my thoughts. Not how am I going to survive? How am I going to get out of this? Just, just turn your head because there's no way you're getting out of this one. And so I turned my face and he's just punching me and just punching me. And I start to feel, you know, blood just coming down and he starts to choke me. And when he's choking me, I, um, he, he yelled and he let me go. And as he let me go, I'm, I'm pulling away from him and cleaning my, my, my blood. And so I can see, you know, what's going on and trying to get myself together. And it's when he yells at me, your blank kid bit me. It's our kid. You know, that's the father of my children. But he said, your blank kid bit me. And he grabbed her by her, her hair and he threw her across the room. And so I'm crawling to her to comfort her and to, you know, to just hold her tight. And I whispered to her, I'm sorry. And that's the day that I said, you have to leave because now the abuse is beyond you. It's now going to your kids. So he left that night and I remember getting a small backpack and I just put whatever could fit in there. And I called my friend, I said, hey, come get me. I'm gonna be 
uh, behind the YMCA that was across the street from us. And she said, I'm on my way. My life changed January 5th of 1995. That day as I pulled up to his apartment, it was a house fire and I'm running up the stairs to his apartment and he's coming out with two of the girls. Um, I can remember um, he had Mercedes like this and he had Angelica with one arm and he was carrying them out the uh, apartment. And so I'm asking him what happened. He's like, I don't know. So I run in there because I'm, you know, I'm asking him for the other two. He's like, he didn't see him. So I run in there, but a firefighter stopped me while I was in there and I told him that there was two kids still missing. And so he yelled to the other firefighters and he told him there's two kids still missing. And he's like, well, you can't be in here because it's dangerous. You know, the smoke inhalation and everything you, you're taking in. Um, when he took me out at the fire truck, they had uh, my daughter, Mercedes, uh, Marcella, and my son. And they were giving them CPR. And as they're giving them CPR, this uh, police officer come, comes get me and he said, are you the mother of the children? And I told him yes, and he took me to this ambulance, and there, it was a firefighter. He had my seven-month-old daughter by the arms. He already had a cover in a yellow bag, and the fire, I mean, the police officer, they came and got me, and he said, um, sorry to tell you, but your seven-month-old baby died. And I asked him to let me hold my child. And the police officer said, I wish I could do it, but because in the, we're investigating, the, you know, the fire and everything, we can't let you hold her. And so I remember asking him if that was your child and it was the last time you can hold your child, would you not want to hold her? And he said, I can't beat that. And he said, let her hold the baby. And I remember uncovering her. And as I uncover her, my daughter was the skin color, you know, the color of my skin, but she was burnt. Her lips were melted, and um, she was the color of a tire. She was burnt, and I covered her up, and I remember giving her a kiss and saying, I'm sorry. And we got to the hospital, and they told us another um, baby had passed away, and they told us that we needed to identify the child. And so he went back there because I couldn't do it. And he came back with some, with the earrings. He placed the earrings in my hand. I already knew who it was because each daughter had different um, gold loops. And as when he placed them in my hands, I knew it was my oldest daughter, Mercedes, my four-year-old. And um, they told us that the other kids were upstairs. And I remember asking them to take me to the back so I can see her before they took her. Uh, Mercedes and um, a police officer walked beside me and a priest walked on the other side and there the priest is praying as we walk in and if so there's like a long hallway and when I got to the back she was just her little chest was just like up where they tried to bring her back and she was just lifeless her little body just just lifeless and I remember yelling at her, it's like, I'm so sorry. So we go upstairs and uh, they had my son and then there was a room between my son and my daughter, Mar Marcella and him. And uh, they told us that my daughter, Marcella was worse than my son. She was literally on relying on, a whole, on, on all the machines, her heart, her, her breathing, everything. She was in a coma. My son's problem was more his heart. And they said that they needed to get him to Louisiana because they didn't have the heart treated, treatments there. So they had to transfer him to Louisiana. As we planned in everything on January 7th, the day that my son was supposed to be transferred to Louisiana, um, he had a heart attack and he passed away. So they're telling us to probably hold up on the funeral because, you know, they didn't have no hope for Marcella. And so a week went by and finally we had to make the arrangements for the funeral for the other three. And at the funeral, it was just a lot of chaos. 
Um, it was so much chaos that it was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? You, you would think people would come together, but it was more like, it was, it was just a lot of just chaos. So that was another thing that is just another story to tell. <laughs> but um, I went back to the hospital and they're just telling me that Marcella heart dropped. Um, she's not doing good. Um, I have to really make decisions of taking her off, off of life support. And I was like, I just couldn't do it. I just, you know, I've, and they're telling me, well, if she makes it through this, she's going to be a vegetable. She's not going to be able to walk. She's not going to be able to see. You're going to have to take care of her for the rest of her life. And I was like, you know what? If that's the way she stays and that's the way she, she makes it out of this, then my responsibility is to take care of her that way. But I remember them telling me to make the decision because they couldn't, um, you know, the, it, it was just, it was no hope. And I remember sitting in a chair in her ICU room. It's a small, it was a, a small chair. And it was a big window in her room. And I remember looking at the stars. It was this big old bright star that I noticed that night. And I remember asking him, if you're real, I need you. I need you to help me. And that day, that time, my, not even a minute, my daughter flatlined. And so I just like, wow, there I am again. I'm going to be alone. My thoughts were already negative because she flatlined. So the nurses are uh, running in and they're like, um, we need you to go out. You know, and I'm, I'm, I was telling them, I remember telling them, no, I want to stay here. I want to be here with my daughter. You know, I, I want, you know, I just want to stay here for her last moments. And then all of a sudden it just got quiet. And then you heard a little squeaky voice saying, I, I want some water. She had to go through therapy. She had to go through all the, you know, all the doctor's visits, um, making sure she's okay. She's 25 years old today. And I can tell you that she's the opposite of what they say that she will be. She can walk, she can see, she can talk, she can do everything. I mean, she was a cheerleader. I mean, you name it, she was a basketball player. Um, she has two kids of her own. She named her daughter after her youngest sister, Angelica, and then, her, of course, her son, Caleb. Um, I really just went through a lot. And going through it, I met this man, Dennis, and he became my friend. And he would always tell me, there's a purpose through the hurt. There's a purpose through all, you know, through all that you have gone through. There's a purpose. And I would look at him like, you're just so dumb, you don't understand. <laughs> and um, we started dating and I was ready to, you know, I had this wall that I was ready to fight him. And he was like, you know, why are you taking that on me? I'm not that person. So it was, I put him through a lot, but he stood. And I remember him writing this, this um, little uh, phrase and he put it on my mirror and he said, you are the key to someone else's breakthrough. And I looked at him, I said, you don't get it. And he said, yeah, when you get your purpose and you understand your purpose, you're gonna become that key. Six years ago, I, was, I went to a funeral. My brother-in-law's cousin um, cut murdered by her um, abusive boyfriend. And when I went back, the caskets were literally set the same way that my grand, I mean, my children's were. And that day, I remember coming back from Houston. I remember really crying out to God, like, why? I was already a broken woman through the abuse, but I was really a dead woman inside, walking amongst the living when I lost my children. Why, why, you know, why did you take away what I love the most? And I remember God really talking to me that day. But the first thing he said to me is you have to forgive. And I was like, does that mean I have to forgive my ex? And I had to forgive him that hurt me the most to be able to step into my purpose. I walked in my healing. I walked, I let God just mold me. I remember calling my ex and asking him I mean, telling him, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. And he didn't, he was just like, I didn't do nothing wrong, but it's okay. I forgive you anyway. 
Now I have an organization called Stand Together Against Nationwide Domestic Violence. And through this organization, we help victims of domestic violence from men, women, and children. Um, we help them to relocate to family members if we need to. Um, it, we help them while they're in the shelter. Um, once they come out the shelter, we help them um, with furniture in their homes um, so they can have a, you know, furniture. They won't feel like it's just an empty place. It, it'll feel like home. Uh, we help them to go back to, to school if they need to, their GD, or go back to college. Um, we help them with work. We show them how to budget so that they won't struggle. Um, we show, um, we help them with um, any um, resumes that they need to be done. We show them how to make a resume. We don't do it for them, but we show them how to survive, how to live, how to be able to depend on themselves. Um, we help the um, youth to also, once they leave the sh um, shelter, we also help them continue to do counseling so that they will be able to heal because when they're in the, in the shelter is just a temporary, so you don't get all the counseling that you need. So we make sure that they get a counseling afterwards um, when they leave the shelter. Um, we help with having, um, show them how to dress for an interview, um, how to, um, to depend on themselves and how to be able to, to find that peace and that love and not to repeat the cycle. And we also help the youth not to repeat that cycle. So we started this program through STAN called Born With A Purpose that focused on the age group 8 to 18. Um, we have mentors that come in, females and males that um, come in and make sure that these young youth are not going to repeat the cycle. They continue to do good in school so they connect with mentors. So we have a mentor program. Um, so um, that's what we do, but I ha um, that's what we do. But I had to do that after I forgave, you know. So it's very important that you forgive those that hurt you, even though you don't want to. But for you to be able to find peace, to find forgiveness in your heart, to be able to live a life without having them giving them the power of holding you, you have to forgive. And so I give God everything because if it wasn't for Him, I would not be here today. I felt like losing my mind. I felt like, you know, I tried to commit suicide. Um, I turned to alcohol and he didn't allow me to become an alcoholic. He didn't allow me to take my life. He didn't allow, allow me to lose my mind. So what I would say to you is forgiveness. Forgiveness is very powerful. Um, to be able to step into your purpose and to that peace. Um, so. I give him everything, so I praise him every day. I worship um, because he has done some amazing things in me. Um, I don't longer, my past don't longer hold me. I can't forgive, forget the past. It will always be in me, the images, the story, but the powerful story has made me who I am today and be able to help others. So, forgiveness, you got to forgive, <laughs> forgive. Thank you for watching Dare to Worship TV. My name is Elizabeth Savage and I dare you to worship.